Hello and welcome to God's Big Picture where we are tracing the story of the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation as we see how the one story of God's plan to save the world through Jesus unfolds. This is part two of the video on the partial kingdom. In our part one, we traced how two promises of God to Abraham are fulfilled, the promise of God's people and the promise of God's blessing. In this video, we'll continue with seeing how two other promises are fulfilled. That is the promise of the land and the promise of God's king. So let's dive in and see more on this partial kingdom. The third promise that God made to Abraham was the promise of God's place, or if you like, the promise of land. Looking back at Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, we see there God making another promise to Abraham. He says, to your offspring, I will give this land. But how exactly does this promise of land get fulfilled? After their detour to meet God on Mount Sinai, we find the Israelites ready to set out on their journey to Canaan at the beginning of the book of Numbers, where we see them set out and God marches in front of them in a pillar of cloud. Surely, nothing can go wrong now. We expect them to reach their destination in a matter of months, but for information, it actually takes them 40 years because of their grumbling and their disobedience. Next, we find the book of Deuteronomy, which takes us to the very brink of the land on the plains of Moab by the river of Jordan. Here Moses speaks to the people one final time before he dies. Addressing the next generation, Moses preaches with them and tells them, do not blow it like we did. Again, he reminds them of what God has said and done in the past and urges them, now it is up to you to believe and to obey, to live in light of the gospel when you enter the land. When Moses dies, he is succeeded by Joshua, and it's under Joshua that the Israelites finally enters Canaan. They defeat the former inhabitants and take possession of the land for themselves. As they do so, they are left in no doubt that the conquest is not a victory they can claim for themselves. God is fighting the battles for them, with a great example of this being the fall of Jericho in Joshua chapter 6. In this story we are told that the people just marched and Jericho falls down. God is at the center of this conquest. The book of Joshua moves towards its conclusion on a very high note. We read the following in Joshua chapter 21, verses 43 to 45. The Lord gave Israel all the land he had sown to give their forefathers, and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sown to their forefathers. Not one of all the Lord's good promises to the house of Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. The God of the Bible keeps his word. He keeps his promises. At this point, we see clearly that God's people are in God's place and they are the God's rule and are enjoying his blessing and the rest that he brings. But before we saw it, all is done, there are more things that continues to happen and especially one thing happens. There is a promise of God's king. We read in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14 to 20, of what Moses had told the people of Israel. When you enter the land, the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. When he, that is the king, takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll, a copy of this law. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to live via the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law. Here we see that before the Israelites entered the land, God planned that they should be governed by a king. The king was not to be an authority separate from God, but would rule other God, submitting to God and to God's law. So, the promise of a king is really a subset of the promise of God's rule and blessing. God rules in his kingdom by means of a king. The book of Judges tells us the story of the Israelites in the promised land in the years after the death of Joshua. It makes depressing reading. The people do not heed the warnings of Moses and Joshua, but they rebel against God's rule. 
The same cycle is repeated again and again and again throughout the book. Then we get to the book of Samuel. And Samuel is the greatest judge to rule Israel. Samuel serves God all through his life. But when he grows old, he appoints his wicked sons as judges in his place. The elders of Israel in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 5 comes to him and demands that he appoint a king to rule them such as all the other nations have. God is angry with them for their request, not because they want a king, but because of their motivation in asking for one. If you like, they want a king instead of God, rather than a king under God. Despite the sinfulness of their request, God gives them what they ask for, and Saul is anointed a king. But the people are not blessed during his reign because he persistently disobeys God. As a result, God delivers his verdict on him through Samuel because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you as king. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. Saul is out. King David gets in. At last, Israel has the kind of king God wants, a man after God's own very heart. David is not perfect. His last leads him to commit adultery with Bathsheba and then to order the murder of her husband. But for most of his life, he seeks to be faithful to God. And so God blesses him and the people through him. God underlines the covenant promises he makes, he makes to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and then prophesies a future king who is far greater even than David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 9 to 11. From 2 Samuel 7 onwards, in the Bible, we are waiting for the arrival of God's king, that is the son of David. What happens next is Solomon succeeds David as king and rules wisely. He brings security and prosperity to the land, and the temple is built during his reign, providing a permanent symbolic dwelling place for God. The nation has never had it so good. We have reached the pinnacle of the Old Testament. It looks now as if all the promises of God have been fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come. But this is not bad. Because King Solomon marries many foreign wives and begins to worship their gods, as we see in 1 Kings chapter 11. For David's sake, God delays his judgment until Solomon dies. But then he causes civil war to break out and the kingdom begins to disintegrate and to divide. The end comes in 722 BC, 200 years after the kingdom is divided. The Assyrians attack Samaria and destroy it. There is no doubt why this happens. As we are told in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 7, all this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them out of Egypt. It's also sad. But it's not the end of the Bible's story. God's work among the Israelites was never intended to be the final fulfillment of his gospel promises. Within the context of the Bible as a whole, the history of Israel serves as a model. It pointed to something bigger and better. If you like, the partial kingdom is just a shadow of the perfect kingdom that God will establish through Jesus Christ. It points beyond itself to Jesus. God may have rejected his model, but he has not forgotten his promises. As we shall see in the next video, it is the law of the prophets to explain this great truth. They stress that the decree of Israel and Judah is not, of, not out of God's control. God is at work, dismantling the model because of the sin of his people. But that not the end. God will never rebuild the model again, but he will establish the real thing in and through Jesus. And here is what Pasha Kingdom is all about. We're going to see more as prophets explain this more. Thank you for watching and see you next time.